She's not recording. Oh, yes, it is. It's been recorded. We're all good. All right, we're good to go, guys. Okay, well, thanks, everybody, um, for coming tonight. This one's a little bit different. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I've sort of been looking forward to this one. I probably have four Zoom meetings every day, and um, I don't get that excited. But, um, no, I've been looking forward to this. So, obviously, thanks, Joe, for um, giving us your time, mate. And um, um, we're about to go over for the next um, 90 minutes or so. Um, yeah, so this this PD session um, is probably something that um, this is the first um, of many. Um, just a little bit of um, investment back, I guess, in our trainers and just to try and um, feed a bit more passion and, and, and move forward like that. So um, I might hand over to Joe um, and, um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the floor, Joe. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mick. Thank you all of you guys for digging deep and um, turning up in the evening when I'm sure you're, you've had a long day already. Um, I, I know I have, so don't feel shy about um, dipping out for a coffee or uh, anything you need to, to, to get a drink or get you through. Um, did you guys all get that um, manual I put together? Yes. And, yes, mate. And um, did you have a chance to just, even if you didn't read it in detail, to have a bit of a flick through at, at sort of what I'd put the different topics and stuff? For the rescue, yeah. 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 Um, I, I wasn't planning to present anything that isn't already in that manual. So the aim of the game is to kind of go through uh, some of the technical stuff again, maybe demonstrate it actually in practice and also to be able to discuss some of those topics. So kind of keep it as a fairly open format. If there's anything that came up that, you know, as you were reading through it, you just thought, no, I've, I've, maybe I've got a better way of doing that. Or you just disagree with one of the conclusions or you've you know, had experiences that don't really line up with that. I thought this would be a good opportunity to just discuss those. Um, my, my background, I've, done, I've been training ARB about 12 years now, um, but for quite a lot of that time, I have specialized quite a lot in rescue. So that's involved sort of tr training companies um, specifically in rescue where they've wanted to up their ability to respond to an accident and also training external agencies. So um, contracting to Tasmania Fire Service to train their vertical rescue team. So I've got a I probably do more simulated rescues, I imagine, than any other arborist in Australia. I, I wouldn't be surprised if I've done 3,000 over the last 10 years. Um, whether I'm doing them well or not is another question, but certainly quantity there. Um, so I'll just see if I can share my screen. How's that? Yep. Yep. Beautiful. All good. Um, everything, that's just what I was talking about already. We'll go for 90 minutes. Stop me anytime, just interrupt me. We can talk. Discussing this plan with Michael, we said, you know, if we end up just spending the entire time talking about one hitch or something like that, so long as you all feel it's time well spent, I've got no particular need to get through these slides or anything like that. Um, Dave, that's, you got back to me with the sort of priority list about what would be important to you guys. And those were the sort of the main priorities. So practical rope rescue techniques and sort of objectives of rescue training were the important things. And then kind of emergency response, responsibilities preparation, you felt less of a priority. Well, it, it, it kind of was mate. And, and all that came back through was just feedback to talking to different trainers, you know, over the last sort of six months, I suppose, and some of their yep. approaches to um, uh, the students um, undertaking uh, climate rescue in our training. Um, so, yep, uh, so that, that's where the basis of the, of the higher ones came, really. Obviously, as we're trainers and 
we, we want to train as well as we can. And also, I, I think more importantly, have a better understanding of the techniques, I guess, that we are training and, and some of the difficulties, you know, uh, the, the training involves in certain aspects of, of, of the delivery from the guys. So, yeah. Um, I, 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 it was a general a generalization and if anybody's got anything else uh, that they want to add just jump on in guys and go for gold <laughs> um it's uh, i'll i'll keep ticking along and just again pull me up wherever but but it's interesting and it's a good thing to talk about those practical rope rescue techniques and of course i think a big part of the unit big part of delivering the revised unit. Are you guys onto the revised one yet? Are you still in 16? Nah, they two are into 20. Into 20. Yeah. So you're delivering, you're delivering 318, you're doing the pole top, the pick off and controlling lateral movement. Yeah. How have you found that so far? Yeah, well, Greg, Greg can probably add a little bit to that. I've had a bit to do with him and, and him using some of the pick off and so forth. So, yep. yeah, that, that, that might be a good one for him. Yeah, Joe, um, I guess some feedback from my end is virtually everything's all good until we get to the, the pick off component. And I find that's where a lot of the time students start to sort of lose it. it takes a little while for them to get used to just putting it all together and getting it right so um other than that like it's pretty good but i find the pick off is probably the most like time consuming side to it all which i could spend i could spend a day just doing pick off with students as, as opposed to you know a few hours with, with some of the other techniques yeah I, I'm, I'm, I find broadly the same. I find that there's a, a 10 to 20% get it very quickly because their sort of background rope knowledge is high enough that the strangeness of it, they learn it fast. And the rest of the class really struggles. And I'm, I'm very dubious about it as well because I think with those remaining 80%, you can get them to achieve it on the day when you've repeated your training three or four times and you've helped them through it. And then they get assessed or, you know, they get assessed the next day and they've just freshly learned it. I can see them doing it, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty suspicious that even one week later under stress, they'd be able to do anything like it at all. So strangely, if I was going to write, rank these in priorities, my highest priority is number six, the effect of the preparation. Um, Number two, possibly roles and responsibilities. Like I think if you, if in terms of a training objective, I think if you can teach them their responsibilities well, the technical side of it probably doesn't matter too much because they'll either keep practicing it themselves and become good at it over time or they won't and they'll be useless in the event of a rescue, whatever. And then, um, and then what to do in the event of an accident. So, um, um, so that, yeah, that, that's sort of my priorities. Like that's in, in, a, in terms of teaching a class, those, that's the order of things that I put my time and effort into. So, um, unfortunately, because it's a practical unit, we end up spending so much time talking about those practical rope work skills that I worry we leave the students with the idea that that's the heart of the unit. And that's the really important thing. So I'll go through go through that I'll go through these slides quickly so we can get on to the um, roadwork stuff. Again, these dot points I've got are just a cut and paste of the orange text boxes in the manual. So again, I'm I'm really not going to say anything that I haven't covered there. I'll just go through it in a different way. Um, this is something that I go over and over with the students. Like I, I bring it up to them every time we talk about rescue. I bring it up. I, I normally tell them that if there's an accident and they choose not to climb the tree, that I, I will buy them a beer and shake their hand the very next time I see them. We talk about how the risk that all of these discussions that we have is going to inculcate in them the idea that an accident happens and a clock starts ticking and they will be judged somehow on how fast they get up the tree. So we go over and over again that 
the average length of time for an emergency service response in Australia is 11 minutes and the average length of time on the emergency call is 13. So if they're the only person on site, they'll probably still be on the phone when the first ambulance turns up. Um, if there are several people on site, so this graph is obviously there's no, ooh, sorry, you'll have to excuse my poor Zoom and slides navigation. It's not something I, I do very often. This graph is just something to help visualize that as, as a rescue gets more complicated, the skill level, can you guys see that all right? Yep. yep. It's clear enough. You know, as a rescue gets more complicated, the skill level required to respond to it goes up. A, a very simple incident where the climber is in an intact system, the climber will almost always self-rescue. So um, one of the things I occasionally end up doing is accident investigation. So I've been involved in a few of those recently. One where the climber cut his neck with a chainsaw and another one where there was kickback and he got the chainsaw stuck underneath a rib. Um, in both of those cases, the climber self-rescued. So the kind of stuff we're training our students to respond to is is not straightforward. Like it's not going to be that we've got someone with a minor injury hanging in an intact system above an empty space, ready to go straight to the ground. If they end up climbing a tree, it's gonna be an absolute clusterfuck. Like it's gonna be a severely injured person or compromised rope system or a suspended load um, or a person who's been knocked unconscious or possibly a pole top. Like a, there's been quite a few on a pole top where the climber isn't in such bad condition, but they've made they've injured themselves enough that they can't come down because they weren't set up to, to self-evacuate. So even a highly skilled rescuer, you know, we, we may be we may be helping them respond to a slightly larger proportion of rescue situations, but the biggest likelihood there is still that either the casualty self-rescues or it's not safe to climb the tree in the, at all or there's no time pressure whatsoever. So I, I think if you, uh, if you were gonna teach, if we had to throw out the whole unit and we were only gonna teach a single slide, this is the one I would choose to teach. Um, explaining to them that it, it's absolutely critical that they understand that it, they probably should stay on the ground in the event of an accident. Um, of the simulated rescues I've watched, well over 50% I've had to stop because the, they were gonna injure themselves. And more arborists are injured each year practicing rescue than are successfully rescued by arborists. So we, we, we all are terrible at rescue and the outcome for our students will also be that they're terrible at rescue. And if we're really, really lucky, the student is the kind of person who stays calm after their friend has been injured and is able to manage themselves and safely climb a tree and perform a rescue. But it's much more likely that their friend is badly injured, the student who is now a rescue climber goes completely to pieces, can't manage themselves at all, and is unable to safely climb the tree. So that that's, I think, my key point for this unit. Um, that's my other one. Um, according to John Ball, who is a, a professor of the University of Ontario, who is funded by the Tree Fund in the US to do a study of aerial rescue, He's done several presentations about that, which I can, I'll send through separately. Or well, Michael, if, Mark, if we ever catch up, I'll, I'll pass on some other resources yep. to you. Um, these are the other things that really, really matter. So if you are going to, if you're rescue climbers, if they're going to achieve anything, this is gonna make the biggest difference to ca casualty outcome. So we'll talk about casualty outcome a bit, and basically it means one month after the accident happened, is the casualty better than they would otherwise have been thanks to the action you've taken? 
has made no difference due to the actions you took or you've made things worse. And, and casualty outcomes, what quite a few sort of rescue agencies use as a metric for analysis of their response. Like, it, it, you know, you, you, it can be tempting to think that we need to get up a tree very fast, but of course, most of the time, the speed that we climb a tree as arborists makes no difference whatsoever to the long-term casualty outcome. So John Bull's comment in relation to this, according to his study, it, a paraphrase is what happens before the accident takes place will be one of the most important determinants of the final outcome for the casualty. So those little details that when you've turned up on site that you've actually checked communication works and you are able to communicate the location and the first aid kit is in decent, decent condition than somewhere nearby, probably more important than anything we do with ropes. Well, definitely far more important. So just relating to that before I move on too fast, do you guys use what three words? Sorry, could you repeat that, Joe? Sorry, do, do, do you know the two apps, what three yes. words and emergency plus? Yeah. yeah. Um, like, I think it's a really good thing to get all of the students doing and also to model ourselves on every site is to not only establish the address, but particularly on a rural site mm -hmm. to identify where the emergency access point is and record the what three words for that point. Mm -hmm. Just so that if there is an accident, I, many years ago, I used to work in the control room for emergency services. There's more police than um, ambulance. But that problem, the problem of particularly on a rural area, the problem of identifying where the accident actually is, is it's traumatic to try and um, extract that information from someone who is working, you know, on a power line span in a gully where they've walked in out over the back of someone's farm and they've driven around and they left the ute up on the ridge and then they've walked down like it, it, imagine trying to relay that information to one of your other work teams when you feel calm and happy and you already know it's a nightmare explaining how to get somewhere Try, trying to do that after an accident when you're pounding with adrenaline is truly miserable so th those little details, like if you can give people the tools to begin accurately summoning assistance, it not only um, obviously has a positive impact in, in as much as you get those resources to you faster, it also has a positive impact because when people feel that they can take concrete positive steps in an emergency, it helps them to take the next step well. Like I, I'm sure you've all experienced that really unpleasant feeling where you know, maybe you're on a train or something and someone has a cardiac arrest in the carriage and you're not sure whether you should get involved or not. You're not sure what the right thing to do is. And that, that, that absolutely crippling feeling of uncertainty and not knowing what your role is, is, is something that is going to be a problem for everyone in a rescue in, in an emergency. So giving people the tools to start taking the first steps actually helps them take the, take the fifth step as well. So those are if, if you haven't used what three words or emergency plus please do download them and check them out like what three words is absolutely wonderful and emergency plus does it for you automatically but only passes on the location where you are actually right now whereas if you use the what three words app you can record where you want them to go which could be more important if you're do you guys work much in in rural areas with the students like forested areas and not really, no. Not really. No. Occasionally. Yeah. Yeah. If if you're teaching um, veg management guys, particularly, those are really important things to pass on to them. Like, what way more important than any rope stuff? Um, we talked a bit about this. I won't bang on, bang on about it too much. So, just a recap that. They're really, it's about three incidents, three rescues out of a hundred. The speed that, it, that we climb the tree has an impact on the final outcome for the casualty. So most arborists with chainsaw injuries 
will, will hit the ground even if they subsequently bleed to death. So the, the idea that, you know, they've, we should be training because if they cut themselves with a chainsaw, we've got just three minutes to stem the bleeding from an artery. It is conceivable. I know of one person who has performed a rescue that was time critical, who's an arborist, and, and only one, and all of the others were not time critical. Um, in that case, a worker cut himself out of a tree, ended up wedged upside down in a branch and vomited in his mouth. And obviously, you know, they, they had to get him upright very quickly. Apart, apart from that, I don't know of any that are time important. So, I'm, you know, I'm sure you guys are teaching this already. Um, just the big trap of these three rescue types that we have to assess now is that, of course, we end up training the stuff that we have to assess. What, what are your class sizes normally class student trainer ratio? Oh, Four to six. seven. Yeah. yeah six seven. six at a time on average. Yep. And how long do you have for rescue? Uh, it depends on the weather, but um, usually a day or two. So, and you've got to do three rescue assessments for each student in that time. Does that include your time sort of training the subject as well? No, no, usually we'll throw up some scenarios and do demonstrations and all that before the assessment day. Yep. Yep. It, that's, well, that sounds fantastic. Like the, one of the problems I've got with the new unit, which I was involved in writing, like I'm, I'm not bagging it out. I think it's better, but one of the issues is that we of course end up teaching, we can end up teaching climbing rescues. So if, if you say you've got say five total days for this unit, pick, picking a number out of thin air, um, and it takes a whole day for pick off and a whole day for pull top, and you've got those number of people you've got to cycle through, you're spending an enormous amount of time already working on, on this. And it's interesting, um, we, I teach for TAS TAFE and we try to do one of the rescue assessments unexpected. So we try to do one of our rescue assessments on our students when they've been told that we're actually doing a rigging assessment on, on, on the person who will become the casualty. Um, and it's fascinating that none of them ever pick basic rescue types. Like once they've been taught complex pickoff rescues, their default response is to do the thing they've been taught. So even where I've put an made an effort to put the casualty on a basal anchor and pointed out the fact that they're on the basal anchor, though I obviously don't say you could use that in a rescue, but I say, you know, they're on a lowerable basal anchor, so they'll have to get off that before they start cutting. Oh no, he's had an accident the rescuer still sets a line and climbs up the tree. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a problem we've got. It's a, it's a problem with this delivery that we're, t we're teaching them complex rope rescue. And consequently, that's what they do when, they're, when they panic. So yeah, I think just, a, just a, a note that really important to make sure you're demonstrating these ones, which feel like they're a waste of time because that, you know, anyone could do that regardless, but really important that um, when you demonstrate any rescue, even like you're demonstrating a complex rescue, that you try and perform those first, that you verbalize to the students. I'm gonna really try and talk them down. Look, there's no way we can get him to self-rescue. Okay, can I do a ground-based? Is there any way for me to set a line? If I set a line for you, could you attach into it and we could lift you from the ground? Okay, we can't do that. Now I'm gonna look for the next basic um, because if we start just teaching them, you know, it's very easy as a trainer to end up quite near to the ground, sort of demonstrating the rope work skills and not demonstrating the precursor steps of, you know, calling an ambulance, controlling the site. And of course, then we repeat that, repeatedly demonstrate these technical skills and lose the opportunity to, oh, sorry, 
This is my last slide before we get onto technical stuff. So I'm going to do exactly the thing I'm criticizing myself for, which is go straight on to rope work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem I struggle with with my students. I'm sure it's a problem for you guys as well. I don't have a solution to it, but other than to just reiterate how important it is, we should never teach a complex rope skill without reiterating again and again and again until the students are completely sick of hearing it, how important it is to not climb a tree if you can avoid it. Do you, do you guys have any questions on any of that stuff so far? Or comments or criticisms or feedback or? No, look, I, I, I think what you're saying about the whole, you know, you, you sort of have a natural tendency to forget the basic stuff and go to the complex stuff. And, and this is not, a, I don't think it's a trainer issue. I don't think it's an ARB industry issue. I think it's a training in general issue where we tend to train more for an assessment more so than for knowledge. Yep. So therefore, you know, the average Joe Blow knows how to do a basic, you know, self-rescue, prussic down, whatever the case may be. So you tend to concentrate a bit more on the harder side and te more technical side. And yep. because the workforces in general have been dumbed down to accommodate the dumbed down assessment, therefore they stick with what they've been taught, which was not the basic stuff, but the complex stuff, because that's what the assessment, so to speak, you know, so... Yep. It's a generalised problem across all industries, I think, where the dumbification, if that's yep. a way of putting it, the dumbification of, of a qualification and simplifying it down means you pretty much, I mean, I've been doing high-risk work licences for three years or something now. You've got two days and plus an assessment to, to nail you know, 70 questions or whatever. Yep. Uh, you're literally training them purely for the assessment. You're yep. not training them how to operate an EWP, how to rescue or anything like that. Like it's 100% trained towards this, isn't it? And my little, my little, uh, very short term of training ARB, and uh, I, I see a very similar thing there. It's, it's, uh, and it's a government issue. You know, they say that you can do it in two days. Everybody's going to do it in two days, or they just struggle to find the work if they want to do it in four or five. You know what I mean? So, everything everybody comes down to that common denominator but at the end of the day it leaves you with no time to really like you say emphasize the whole process of it yeah it 100 percent. it i think some of this stuff i think we demonstrate best like the the, the emergency preparedness i think we actually demonstrate best in every other unit because when we're teaching tree felling or when we're teaching tree climbing that we put that effort in to establish the location, communicate the location, identify the first aid kit, prepare the rescue kit, all this kind of stuff. I think that reiterates to the students quite well the importance of that preparation. But yeah, this, this issue, even though I drone on about it, to this, you probably get an idea already how much I drone on about it. Um, I'm way worse with the students and they still ignore the basics and go straight to a complex rescue once you've taught them the complex rescue. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what the solution is, but. I've got a question, I guess, for our trainers as well as you, um, Joe. You mentioned 10 minutes ago about, oh, you didn't use the term, but it was like a random rescue. Yeah. I guess, first of all, to our guys, how often do, is that something that we throw in, you know, if the guys are doing some pruning or rigging or standard climbing, um, do we throw them in? And Joe, do you, is that something you recommend? Greg? We don't, Greg? yeah. Yeah, we don't, I don't generally do that because we've yep. sort of got our fingers up our freckles trying to get it finished, uh, the one unit we're working on. However, I used to do that with with the utility companies i'd call my crew out and make them do a, a rescue just on site for no reason so yeah, yeah. something we have done but just we don't yeah i usually throw something in towards the end of the afternoon just yeah. before we finish you know it's um and then i might just add something off it uh towards rescue on towards rescue which we hadn't really discussed prior and prior prior training weeks um, 
yeah, and we just sort of we sort of squeeze it in where we can, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, it wasn't that wasn't a loaded question, and I something that I always thought about in the back of my mind, and and when you mentioned it there a while ago, Joe, it's sort of I'd yep. throw that in. Yeah, I, I don't include it as part of the lesson plan. I just yep. randomly, you know, if we got time, if we have time up our sleeve, I'll yep. include it in the the training for the day. But once again, it comes back to that time factor, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, just on that before as well, Joe, you were talking about, um, you know, ha I don't know how we're going to get the guys off focusing on complex options before they, you know, go to the simpler options. I know it's not ideal, but if we broke this unit into two and had a ground-based rescue unit as a prereq for a complex, that would give them a fair grounding, you know what I mean? Like it, it would focus entirely on the ground-based side of things before they went to complex. Does that make sense? That, yeah, absolutely it does. They've it's 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 a really tricky one that because one well, number one they've told us eight years for the current qualification unless we've totally fucked it up. So it's likely to be. Yeah, don't change it any sooner, please. Yeah, no, I I don't think I'm I'm not hearing that that there is anything major. It's likely to be 2028. That's the next funded review of these qualifications. The other issue I would have with that personally would be, would businesses just adopt that unit as their preparation? And I don't know that that would be a big problem if they did, but I think we would need to have a conversation as an industry about um, how good at rescue are we gonna try and be? Because at the moment we claim that we're gonna be quite good at it and in fact, we're achieving total, totally, totally hopeless at it. Uh, Joe, a lot of the time, I, I put it back on the climbers that are in the tree as well to think about, you know, what what situation are they going to get themselves into during you know, their work methods when they're climbing around the tree and to think about um, setting up ergonomic systems that are easy for them to be rescued if they get in trouble in the first place. So I sort of put it back on them to say, well, you need to think about the best situation, you know, in regards to somebody going up to rescue you, not creating problems up there for yourself in the in the case of an emergency. Yeah, you're, you're, I think you're dead right. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys have went across Graham McMahon much. His, his big thing was um, always that every minute we spend teaching rescue do we actually, are we actually seeing arborists being successfully rescued for the effort that we're putting into this skill? Or should we scratch it completely and spend an extra three days teaching them not to hurt themselves in the first place? Um, and yes, we'll still have, we'll still have situations where we have injured people in trees that we can't get down, but it's not like we've succeeded in eliminating that the way we're doing it at the moment. Up one. It, it it really is, it really is. Um, should we? Do you guys want to grab a water quickly, and then we'll get onto some? Has everyone got a drink? Does anyone need to take a short five minute break or anything, and then we'll get onto some rope stuff? A water, a water. What did you say? A water. <laughs> water. I'm trying to be. I think we're being recorded, so I'm. I'm it's it's Brent's last week this week, Joe. <laughs> okay. He's like, come on, just throw yeah. it at me. <laughs> I'll, I'll, have, I'll have a water. Average. <laughs> it's a water. <laughs> Woke up feeling crap today and, and, and I drank a fair bit of water yesterday, so I'm blaming the water. You gotta you wanna watch that stuff. Is that to water, is it? Uh, Brisbane. Brisbane. Brisbane water. Oh, Brisbane. Well, I wouldn't Brisbane want to be drinking water. Brisbane water at the moment, I reckon. No. There's enough of it. Uh, in all fairness, it's been fair bit stirred up over the last couple of weeks, the water, so yeah. I don't know, mate. That water, that river's brown every time I've been in Brisbane. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Yeah. Just, just usually doesn't have ten pontoons floating down hitting the bridges, mate. So. No, no. <laughs> oh, sorry, I mean a hundred pontoons. <clears throat> All good. I think we're right, Joe. 
Good, keep rolling along. So let's talk about some rope stuff then. Um, this is, I'll just stop sharing for a second. Is that back? Am I full screen again? Yep. Yep. Um, yep. So this is the rescue kit that I recommend. Those, those three items. Um, we teach, so we've got a prusik, one prusik loop with a carabiner on it, a spare carabiner, and a pulley and a carabiner. And we do every single rescue type with that kit. So we don't teach specialist slings, extra rigging gear, or anything like that. Do explain to the students that, you know, there are much easier ways of performing rescues if they do have like a descender that's rated for two people or a specialist sling that'll fit around the top or a personal mechanical advantage kit. But basically we want to train using the equipment that we know they'll have there or they can jimmy up some other way if they don't have this exact stuff. So pretty much every rescue that I'll show, it's just that extra kit. Um, transferring the casualty to a rescue system. So obviously we're going to go for casualty self-rescues as our first choice. If they can't get themselves down, we might go for assisted self-rescue. So, you know, we might um, see if we could belay their tail to make it easier for them to descend or something like that. Or, use the tail of their own line to lift them up a bit to free a device, those kind of things. We would also try ground-based rescue. So it's, it's really surprising how often, if you really put your mind to it, you can make something into a ground-based rescue. So we can set a floating anchor in a tree, you know, set up a, a, another climbing line through it, clip the carabiner onto the tail of the climber's line and slide it up to them. And then all they've got to do is connect a rope on, connect one carabiner on, and we can do everything from the ground. So, pretty, you know, if we've got a conscious climber, even if they're pretty badly hurt and, you know, struggling to control bleeding, say, and their system's completely kaput, or they've fallen out of the tree and landed in a branch, even in, in those conditions, we'd probably be able to perform a ground based rescue. Our next option would be to climb up and either assist them or use their, their, their system to come down. So by the time we get into this stuff, things have gone pretty badly wrong. By the time we get into this, if the rescuer isn't calm and under control, things can go south really, really fast. We could end up with the rescuer stuck or both, both parties severely injured. Um, an absolute classic. So I've got this slide up only I'm sure you're all familiar with this already, but an absolute classic, if you can see just down here, is connecting the casualty to some part of the rescuer's kit that isn't that central connection point. So you can see in the image, the casualty, can you see that bit? Yep. Can you see my mouse? Yep. Um, that's supposed to be the casualties bridge. It doesn't matter too much what you connect on, on on the casualty. Like worst case scenario, if you connect onto this or they connect onto the, the textile and they slide sideways, they just come down feeling pretty uncomfortable. But if you connect the top carabiner, just stop sharing for a moment again. So there's my harness. Um, central. Uh, connection point, that's where my rescue system, or my, my climbing system is going to be attached to. Um, isn't ideal, I know, but you can see that if I sling someone off that, the load that they're applying passes through that ring on my harness and straight up into my system. So the, the load isn't applied to my harness at all, and it's not applied to my hips, it's not applied to uh, anything other than shared through that central ring. As soon as I start clipping it onto my bridge instead, so if, if, I, if this is the, 
That's the connection to the casualty. And I clip it onto my bridge. We've immediately got a serious problem. Number one, the load's coming onto me. I'll just lift that up so you can see it. Number one, the load is coming across my bridge. Number two, if I twist my body at all, I've now got them hanging in one direction. Can you see that? Does that make yep. any sense? That's going to apply the casualties full weight to my, to my hips. It's going to twist me on my side. It's going to sort of turn me 90 degrees parallel to the ground and make it basically impossible for me to go up at all. Like I've, I've essentially come to a dead stop. The only thing I can do if I'm lucky is actuate my own system and descend straight down while sort of hanging sideways in the air. If, if, the, if the casualty was very light and I was very fit, I might be able to fix that. But if the casualty is heavier than me or I'm tired already from climbing to perform the rescue, that's basically the end. I either succeed in going straight down wherever I am once that happens or I'm stuck there until the rescuers arrive. So that's a super critical point. How are you going with pole top rescue? Greg, you've been teaching this for a while now. Yeah, good. Good? Yep. Yeah, yeah, pole tops. There's no dramas with, with pole tops at all. Yep. It's mainly the pick off, but um, I do find I do find it hard sometimes to get to get the, a good tree to do the rescue on. You know, often we're removing a tree that's already unhealthy, or the yep. the diameter of it's too narrow. And it, I know that the, the uh, we're meant to go go up five meters and you know zero point five from the top of the pole, but it yep. just doesn't always work out that way, depending on the the tree that we've got in front of us sort of thing but um we we do our best you know to you know just do what's um recommended but yep. um what else is there i think it's i don't always get through all pole top all four pole top rescues with them sometimes i might do three and miss out on one because i only need to be assessed on one yeah but i don't always get through all the rescue scenarios with them um but by the time they've finished, that I, I feel as though they're quite competent in rescuing someone from a pole. But yeah. we don't always do all four rescues. It um, it makes me more nervous than any other thing that I have the students doing. Like the, the yeah, the two two students, both of whom are wearing spurs, close to each other like moving around god i yeah yeah i'm always up there with them yep. so I, I usually if they're the ones i'm usually the one being rescued after i show them how to rescue you know um each rather than putting them in that situation joe so yep. if if something does happen then i'll talk them through it and uh, i'll make sure that they you know at least take their spurs off and don't just throw them down to the ground and all that sort of thing. So if anyone gets spurred, it's probably going to be you. Probably going to be me. Yeah. 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 Good for you. <laughs> but yeah, and it has been, we've had a couple of close calls up there with the spurs on, but we're usually pretty careful because as, as we say, we, we take it pretty easy, you know, three times slower than what we normally would. Just little steps at a time rather than rushing into it. Yep. Oh, perfect. Um, so is this one of the ones you teach, like go, go, going to, so that's, that's just a different way of putting a sling on the top. With a Greer Greer? Uh, sure. I haven't, we haven't really used that device up there yet. Oh, sorry, that's, that's just a, that's a regular descender. It could be anyone's climb. It could be just a regular. Oh, regular okay. Climb. Yep. Yep. Um, but that's for the rescuer. The rescuer is, their plan is to probably stay up there. I yep. haven't shown the lanyards on this drawing just because it gets cluttered. Yeah. So this is just a way to get to the top of the tree and install a lowering point so that someone on the ground can lower the casualty down. So someone on the ground is going to attach a descender around the base of the tree 
um, and get ready to do the lowering. And then the rescuer, who's this chap on the right, can either come down with the casualty on their system or can just stay up there and stay out the way. And normally that seems to be a better option. Um, but if you were using, if you had a sling that was the right size, you don't need to obviously rig this off the working end of the climber's line unless you wanted to. It just seems to work quite well because once once the climber's got their line tied around like this, they're obviously the rescuer becomes secure. And then yep. you, don't, you don't then have to put another sling on. That's a great idea. Do you, do you have the question about using the existing rigging gear come up every single class? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have, have you got a good answer for that yet? Uh, what do you recommend? <laughs> I always just say absolutely not, but you've got to train, you've got to train and assess, assuming that they've cut it or damaged it. And when you're panicking and insecure is the worst time to try and work that out. So you should have systems that, and then they say, but didn't you just tell us you shouldn't climb the tree if you can avoid it? I'm like, yeah, you got me. I don't know. <laughs> I guess if it is good, it is the safest thing to do, but we can't yeah. train or assess it. That's right. Yeah. I, I can recall that question being thrown at you once in one of the Vermeer seminars. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I answered it any better then. <laughs> well, so this is, this is the one, if they do have to climb a tree, this is probably the one that we'd rather that, that, that they do. This is probably the ideal situation where there's someone else on the ground who's savvy enough to set up that lowering system. Um, and that's my, my second favorite. I, I'm normally in, I normally work in a crew of three and there's normally two decent climbers and one person who could be anyone. But that third person, I would say most of the time, I wouldn't trust them to build a lowering device around the base of a tree most of the time. So, so this is what I practice more than anything else. And I think for basically every single tree climbing design, device, except a spider jack three, this works well. So all of the SRT, SRT stuff, it, it works great. Um, you can do it with just a prusik. You have a little bit of an issue fair leading the line into the prusik if you do it with just a prusik just the spider jack three because it relies on the orientation of the device to work doesn't doesn't work like this when you've separated it mm. i found found the spider jack three to be really hard to use in rescue situations you're, you're dead right it is it's weird because it because it it's only designed to work in the exact configuration that like a, a regular standard mrt with one person on it everything else you can do with it like pick offs doesn't work for those at all. The, the Spider Jack 2 was great for pickoff, but the 3 is a no go. Yeah. Yeah, we've had troubles with it. As soon as they pull one out and we're doing rescue, I, I tell them to put it away. Yeah. We use something I else. <laughs> I, I do too. Yep. But so yeah, have... that, that scenario there is probably the main one that I train them up in. Yep. Yeah. Me too. We we do everything else, but this we go we go through this more. They all, no matter as you say, not all of them will practice the rescue where they come down with the casualty. Every single student will practice this multiple times and then be assessed in this. Um. You got, guys, has everyone here who's, who's teaching this stuff, have you all used this and have you had any issues with it? Any points we should talk about with this? Yeah, there's only there's only one that comes to mind with me. If, if you wanted to support the casualty on their way down because they were injured, you know, it's not ideal because then all of a sudden they're relying on the 
themselves to sort of push themselves away from the tree trunk or avoid any tree stubs or that that have been left. 100%. So you're, you're completely, I, I, I find, here are the issues that I encounter with the students. The first issue that I encounter is um, that this is shown as a clove hitch, but most of them prefer to tie an alpine there instead. Um, if they get their line set fairly sloppily, like they don't get it choked up neat, and then they don't tie the alpine well, so they've got six inches of slack between the um, running bow line and the alpine. And then instead of using a zigzag, maybe they're using a real sloppy long uh, VT. And then they're using a big pulley like this absolutely massive one with a long carabiner. And then the casualty's got a long bridge. It's conceivable that they've got about a meter or a meter and a bit of, of distance that, that that's their minimum take up on that MRT. And of course, if the casualty is very high and dug in tight to their spurs and on a lanyard that, like on a steel core lanyard with one of those Gibbs ascenders that you can't release under load, the students can really struggle to get the casualty off their lanyard and onto this. Would, would in that situation, Joe, which yep. possibly I've mentioned in the past to, to other to students as well, to roll it around the opposite side and bring it over the top of the, the, the stump. So it gives you a little bit more lead. Yes. Like roll, roll your choke yep. knot around to the opposite side and pull your line up over the top. Yep. I think you you would obviously then have to drop the the choked knot quite a way down the stem because yep, obviously so where slip, slip off yeah yeah where we've shown it. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure about that. So I think it it fixes the first problem, but it obviously introduces another one that which is that unless you've got some form, some way of retaining that line. Uh, up and over the top in, in its place. If yeah. they start to walk around to the side, the line could easily roll off the side of this. And of course, as soon as it rolls even to here, like yeah. if, if we imagine that line coming straight across the top of the stem, everything's good. Yeah. If we imagine it coming to there, we've now got uh, the, the line actually wants to keep walking off around the side of the stem. Can open up, yeah. yeah. So, so you could put a couple little, like a V cut on each side at the top, and the, like say you're putting wing little scarfs in the side to stop it slipping up, little scarf on each edge at the top to stop it going one side or the other. If you just, yeah, you just if they tied it nice and snug to start with, it shouldn't be an issue. But it, that 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 extra lead that they do get sometimes is is a fair bit. But I, I think what you're talking about, Brad, I, I've done it heaps when we were pulling trees over with. Put the knot on the top side of the log, yeah, and to stop it slipping off the log, and put a little V, v on the yeah. on the back and the front, notch it and, out, yeah, and notch the top out so it can't slide sideways. Yeah, it, it it's a really terrifying idea to think of the yeah, way that you're chainsaw using going. Stuff yeah. Yeah. That's about it. the only way you could do it, isn't it? Yeah. Um. Well, people have people have been trying this stuff quite a while let me show you there are ways i'll show you another way that... how do you go about how do you go about lifting them as well to get a bit of weight off of their lanyard at that, in that situation you get a bit of mechanical advantage from that pulley obviously but um let me i'll just sorry i've just jumped away i'll just go show you there are ways to do this it's taking a while to load this it's a massive document um, this is um, so this technique has been used successfully in the States. Well, um, that's uh, that's plastic. Um, they call it chopping board edge protection, which is a 
specialist low directional rescue thing for used on clifftop rescues or structure yeah. rescues. And then they use these actually homemade little rope retention um, channels that they bolt into the top. So it, it has, pe people have encountered this same problem and it has, it has, um, does have solutions. For me, I've, I've the heaviest person I've rescued with this setup is 140 kilos. Um, I, I had no problem. Like the step step one is to actually get this real snug. So where it's illustrated here, it would be a disaster because obviously this is showing still a lot of slack here get it super, super tight. And that carabiner needs to be super, super tight up here. So you've got the least amount of sloppiness in your setup. Um, if you were using a real long sloppy VT, um, I would retie it as a distal. So I'd retie it nice and snug to that. If we needed to, we could, we could get rid of the, um, get rid of that pulley. So it's saving a little bit of extra distance there. And if I absolutely had to, if they had a crazy long bridge for some reason, I'd consider using a prusik to just tie their lower to the lower Ds together and connecting into that. But all, all of those things would save, you know, we're talking about 60 centimeters then. Um, the next trick is to swivel this round the trunk. I think someone said that already. So we're bringing that one important, the next problem the students sometimes have is if we swap these two around, if this was the casualty and this is the rescuer, this system, this running borderline system is obviously only set up to cinch if it's pulled either straight down or in this side. If you took that tail and pulled it towards the rescuer now, it wouldn't cinch, the whole thing would rotate around the trunk and slip down and there'd be little squeals of alarm from me probably on the ground like oh god what are they done <laughs> um but if you if the trainer if the rescuer rotates this knot towards themselves they're buying additional lift distance it isn't real lift of course what you're going to do is just sort of cant the casualty off their spurs and bring them slipping onto you um that that'll normally do it like at the very least, at first you're pulling them closer towards the tree, which should get their lanyard free to bring them onto you. Greg, one trick with this, this is actually a rescue that was developed originally by Graham McMahon. And when he teaches it, he, he does bring the casualty right over. He would wedge his knee just in here. And he would cant his knee at 45 degrees out from the trunk so that as he brings the casualty sort of comes swinging around onto him, you're actually kind of redirecting the line away from the trunk. So of course, once the casualty's down about 10 meters, the rope angle becomes quite tolerable for them. They're not being pulled hard into the trunk, but that first little bit, um, if you can push it out with your knee, it makes life easier for them. Awesome. Thanks, um, Joe. Oh, j j j I it's hard to do on a very heavy person if you're demonstrating it. So if you're gonna demonstrate it, pick the lightest student because it's easy to make it look easy then. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> uh, other problems they have, they forget, sometimes they forget that they need double the rope length to get down because obviously we need two rope lengths here. Another problem, oh, sorry. And another problem is, um, it lowers very easily. So for example, in a zigzag, when you're hanging in a harness with a zigzag, you really do believe that touching it will drop you. So you're very familiar with touching it gently. It seems that when students first rescue someone else, they are very casual with just grabbing that and starting to drop them. And the, the, rest, the casualty normally gets an exciting first meter. So just, on a trainer perspective, I'm sure you do this already. Anytime they're in that situation, if I'm not the casualty, I'll go and put my hand on the tail. Just that one extra person means they can't really drop. No one can really be dropped. You're, you're actually in control. 
Good, good. Um, I'll just, I might actually skip back to that other document briefly. It's worth looking at this, which I didn't put in the manual for you. Just that, has, have you guys practiced that? So, something that, it's something you, you can practice at ground level just where the student, if you just get them to stand in spurs, um, take the straps off and then hold the upright shank of the spur and pull the shank forwards. And it, it pivots the um, lower part of the gaff, the stirrup of the gaff off under their foot and pops the spur out of the tree. So if we, sorry, am I actually succeeding? Yeah, you're, not, you're not sharing that yet, mate. Uh, um, now we got it. That's better. Yeah. So that's that's something that once you've done it once, if you've ever done it, you'll never need to do it again because it's so pleasant to do it to someone. Um, you'll remember it the rest of your life because it really does. You 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 just pull the shank forwards, and by the time you get to twenty degrees, it starts to rotate naturally. You just very easily lift their foot, pivot the spur out, and it pops free. Even for someone who's very heavy with that full weight in it. So I think like that's something really worth getting the students to practice because another um, another approach to that issue would be to once you've got them hooked up and you've got it as tight as possible to go down and pop the spurs. Good, good. any other comments about this? Yeah, any, any recommendations on how to send the spurs down? I know in an emergency situation, most people probably just throw them to the ground. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you know, during training, I just, I just don't feel comfortable clipping, uh, climbing spurs onto lines and lower, lowering them because they're sharp. But yeah. I don't know. I, a carabiner seems to work all right, but I, I, I always just put the carabiner them onto my harness and just keep them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's the right answer or not. Yeah, that's another option. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think once we've demonstrated that spur removal, I think most of the time I would keep the students in their spurs for the for the rescue. Okay. Um, yep. Like I think they could. That's something they could practice once at ground level, and then do all. Once they've done it, they'll never forget it. Yeah. They, they could do all their subsequent assessments um, with the spurs on, and just to jump back to our our point about the likely complexity that they can actually respond to. Um, I, I did rescue training for a guy once who subsequently performed a pole top rescue two weeks later. And um, the whole rescue was videoed by a traffic management guy on site. Um, the, they had a contract climber in who felled the head of the tree out with the rope still in mm -hmm. and locked his legs when it went, like he saw it was happening as it went, he locked his legs and his upper, his thigh bones or whatever they're called, went through his kneecaps. Oh. So, you know, we just spent like several days practicing pole top rescue. And then two weeks later, this happened and we had it all on video as well. So it's, you know, it's quite interesting to watch because the first point is of course, there's no time pressure for that whatsoever. Like think about the casualties outcome. Obviously the climber is, um, is screaming, but, but other than the casualty, other than him um, disconnecting or trying to self-rescue and hurting himself more, it's really unlikely that it's gonna change the outcome for the casualty, whether you're up there in five minutes or 50. He, he, the climber's obviously, the casualty's obviously not gonna be happy about it. Um, but realistically, your, your objectives now would be to make sure you don't make anything worse and make sure that he doesn't try and do something stupid to get himself down because he's panicked. Like th those are the key things. So control those and then start to respond to actually getting the person down. 
So here's some of the crazy stuff that happens on this video. Number one, there was an EWP parked on site that no one fetched. Um, like it's, it, it was parked just up the road and they'd, because they'd chosen to fell this out, they didn't use an EWP to fill it out. They decided to send someone up to, 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 to drop it. Um, but there's an EWP like 40 meters from this happening that no one thought to get. The guy who climbed the tree went to the truck about five times. So at one point he went to the truck and came back with a throw cube. Like then he went to the truck and came, you know, I'm making this up. I can't remember exactly what it was, but went to the truck and came back with his spurs, went to the truck and came back with a harness, went to the truck and came back with a rope. Like uh, shaking so much that he, he should never have climbed up that tree. Um, luckily, so they, they cut the guy's line, which is probably also a mistake. They should probably have found a way to cut the tree off it and release the tension more slowly rather than having this suddenly recoil up in the tree. It was still, because it was still set, it was still loaded. Because um, who knows how you're going to throw the climber around when you, when you suddenly cut a rope. Um, luckily, they had stubs there. So he was able to go up there with a spare rope just put the climber on the casualty on a spare rope and then came down together because there was a there was a decent high point. Um, I don't know why I started that story. I've completely forgot what we were talking about. Sorry. Um, yeah, I can't remember. I've gone to the next slide. I've forgotten. Um, pick off. Is this the pickoff you teach, Greg? Yep. Yep. <laughs> sure is. I have the same issue that um, I have exactly the same issue that I can normally get a, a whole class through it, but some of them can only do it when they've practiced it like three or four times in a row just before and they get through it through following a process where you teach them step one is go up on the you know go up and attach the carabiner when you're level go up on the english till you reach the point you want to lift them to go up on the french until the slack's gone now come down on it now to put your friction in uh, come down on the english and if they learn it as a procedure like that they're able to repeat it but i'm I, I'm confident that three days later, if I sprung it on them, it would just be a total dog's breakfast. Mm -hmm. Is that what you you find? Well, initially I was teaching it with with them rescuing each other, and then with COVID, I, yeah. I, we started using the dummy more for rescue than anything else, and yeah. I actually found it a lot easier with the dummy because it took it took a lot of the the stress off, rather than having someone you know, go up on the wrong prosic and then, you know, disconnecting and putting it onto a dummy was just a lot, a lot easier. Obviously it was um, fully weighted. Yeah. But, um, and a lot more time consuming to set up. Yeah. But um, yeah, I found that once I introduced the dummy, they were, do they were actually getting through it a lot quicker. Yeah. And what what sort of scenarios do you use for the for the simulations? Just basic, you know, if they they've got a leg injury, they've come yep. down, they've slipped from a branch, um, you know, had an impact with the trunk. They've just realistic kind of things. They might be unconscious because it's been a hot day, and they're dehydrated, and all of a sudden now they've passed out. Yeah. Um, I guess the trickiest thing is the size of the tree required to, to actually do the pick off to get the lift. You yep. know, and a lot of the time after we practice it, uh, the, the guys turn around and, and ask me why, why is it necessary? I can't see myself having to ever do that realistically um, in any situation. So uh, like, I know there's other options, and that's a part of the performance criteria. But, you know, I, I think there's other ways as well to rescue someone rather than just do the pick off. It's, um, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because one of the ways I'd 
often teach this five years ago would be to put someone on cam descenders where they're unable to go down with a canopy anchor and then as as you know like even a even a comparatively minor injury turns into a total disaster if you can't find a way to lift them yeah yeah um I think that's getting a lot less common so that maybe the likelihood of finding someone who's completely unable to be adjusted at all to take any tension off is unlikely. Yeah. When I worked for TAFE, we used to do a self rescue assessment on cam descenders. Yeah. But that's, that's going back about five years ago. So yeah, yeah, we haven't really had the need for that of recent times because it's pretty rare that you see someone just going up on cams yeah. unless they're just accessing the going to MRT system. Yeah. Do, do you teach, do you use this elsewhere in climbing? So do you use it for like the counterbalance on a branch or anything? Not really. No, not for, do you mean for rigging and stuff or climbing? For climbing. Uh, not really. No, not I haven't really thought outside the square to yeah. sort of do that yet. It, I, I, I do, I demonstrate it and I try and get the outside of rescue and I try and get the, the very enthusiastic MRT students of whom there are fewer and fewer because they've all gone SRT. I might try, <laughs> well, I try oh. to get them to, to use this. Yeah. Um, so if you use it for climbing regularly, it's like having an extra climbing rope with you all the time. Because you can, you know, you can tie that carabiner off whenever you want, but anytime you need five meters of rope, you can just pull slack through. But the really cool thing is if you were to take this carabiner or the termination end of your rope, let's say you climbed out along a branch. So you're getting to the skinny part where it's getting a bit hard to balance and you're feeling your core engage and you, you know you, you need to, you're needing to start using your lanyard to lift the branch up rather than the classic tree climber thing of you sort of tilt your body over on one side and it, use your lanyard from side d to side d and put tension in your line to bring the branch up one thing you can do is secure this termination around the branch so pull slack in throw the line ahead of yourself clip pass it around the branch and clip that back to a marlin spike hitch here. And then as you continue out along the branch, instead of descending on your main adjuster, descend on the prusik, the English prusik. And of course, as you descend, just like a pickoff rescue, it lifts the branch up to you. So you can completely offset your own weight on the branch. Like a, it's startling how much further along a branch you can get using this than using normal arborist methods. And what's also startling is when you get there, instead of your core being engaged and you're, you know, you're 90 degrees over on your side, making poor cuts in a rush because you don't like being in there long, you're, you're super relaxed. You can just hang out. Like you could, you could cheerfully spend time chatting and secretarying where even a very good climber is struggling to even get there. So it's, not part of the unit at all, but it is the kind of fancy technique that actually might get some of your MRT students using this more regularly. The unit doesn't say you have to use this kind of pickoff. It says a pickoff style rescue. So for SRT students, for people who are completely SRT, I've stopped even getting them to do this. We do that now. Have you, have you tried this one, Greg? I haven't. That I was reading reading this this afternoon, and I mm. saw that there, and I my eyes sort of lit up, and I thought, "Hang on, that's that's quite basic, and it makes sense." It's so it's just the same as it's basically just like the MIT pick off. You're just adding this, adding a pulley and a prusik and a carabiner. Yeah. So again, it's that super low, super low impact. Um, we have a three to one MA system if we wanted to lift. So that three legs of rope. Um, if the rescuer 
pulls up on this one, it's a tutor one. If the rescuer stands on this with a like a pantin whilst they're lifting this one, um, you're partially counterbalancing. So you've actually got, it's actually very easy to lift even a very heavy casualty by using this. Something that's really nice about this is that, of course, it doesn't matter how you've redirected the line above. So even at a really miserable um, rope location, you can normally rig up some sort of redirect and, and get going on this rescue. Just like our first whole top rescue scenario, the rescuer doesn't, we're not expecting the rescuer to descend with the casualty here. The objective is for the rescuer to use this to lift the casualty out of their system. Then you could either, having freed them, put them on a new system or rig them off your own bridge or something like that ready to descend. But normally we'd plan to um, use the, oh, sorry. We'd normally plan to use the English to perform our rescue from then on. That's not in the MIS for rescue, is it? No, it isn't. It, it, it will be in the next release. Um, and I have to say, I would choose this one over the MRT pickoff most of the time. I think I will as well. <laughs> Yeah. Just yeah. As you said, a lot of the guys now are preferring to climb off the, the single line anyway. Yeah. But um, yeah, it just looks easier. It it is a lot easier. It well, so I think the MRT pickoff, if you practice it a lot, becomes something that's so good. If you had a good rope angle. You can do whatever you want from, from, from that pickoff. Like you can lift a casualty a little bit, then reclimb the tree and bring them another five meters up. You know, you can easily position them in front of you and support them with your knees, or you can send them down separately. Like it, it takes seconds to do. You can lift even a really heavy person. It's really, really smooth. But number one, you have to have practiced it hundreds of times. And number two, you need a really good low friction anchor point directly above the casualty. That's the other hard thing about it. If you don't have yeah. a tree that's structurally, you know, the architecture of the tree is not designed that way, it makes it really hard to, to do that rescue scenario. But even with the SRT pick off there, you still need a, a, a good redirect to lift them up straight. You, you do. This one doesn't matter so much because basically you're no longer using the rope above you as a, and you're no longer, and unless you do a little bit of counterbalancing by standing on the tail, you're, you're functionally using a separate M a, a mechanical advantage system now. So it doesn't matter so uh -huh. much if the rescuer has a bad rope angle or is in a bad working position. Whereas yeah. the, M, you know, the MRT, you really do need to have that good rope angle. Definitely, yeah. I can see what you mean now just by looking at the picture. Yeah. yeah. So, so this, here, the downsides of this compared to the MRT pickoff. Number one, the casualty is always going to be quite a fair bit below you. So if you wanted to descend with them, um, it's much harder to give them good support. If you choose to descend with them, part 50% of their weight, oh, sorry again, is coming back to this. So whereas with the MRT pickoff, you've got the prusik between you and the casualty to balance the difference between you and the casualty, but you, you feel kind of free of the casualty. In this one, it really does feel like if you choose to descend with them, they're kind of um, jammed in against you. If you just, if you want to, you can, as it's set up at the moment, you can actually come straight down on this. So if the rescuer lets slack in through here, they start descending. This comes down, this gets closer to that, but it doesn't actually suck anything up because it's SRT, not, SR, not MRT. 
So this is getting closer. Um, this is actually dropping. So this bit is behaving a little bit like an MRT system. And eventually this will actuate that Prusik. So you can, if you want to, just go straight down. But there's all sorts of stuff behaving funny right there between your legs. Um, like this is all dangling between your legs as, as you descend. You really want to make sure that you're, you're, you're not sliding this with your leg or something like that, that probably that someone's holding onto the tail. So my default would be if I could to use that Prusik and stay out of the way, like lift them up, get them off their gear, then just use the Prusik to slide them down. Mm -hmm. I'd keep a hand on this or I'd get someone on the ground to just back me up on that. Um, if I knew I wanted to descend with the casualty, I would probably build myself a basal anchor for this line if I could. So I'd probably set my rescue up off a basal anchor before I even got going. And then I'd probably get someone I trusted to lower me down off the basal anchor rather than try and that way I can just concentrate on the casualty. So I do the lift, lock everything off, even tie a stopper knot in here, got my redirect, detach my lanyard and let someone else lower me down. Um, yeah. the, the vertical rescue teams down here, but basically um, as soon as they have a rescuer who can't be lowered by someone else, they say the rescuer is now in isolation. So the rescuer has now become a potential, a potential risk. So to them, even the idea that the rescuer disappears off up the tree without being on a basal anchor is a scary thought. Mm. Just one thing there, though, yeah. Joe. Yeah. If if they've been working in a tree that's um, has has a, a little bit more of a weaker structure, and they've decided to throw in a canopy anchor rather than a basal anchor bec because you know the less weight up up top in their line, you you might not have that choice to lower lower them from the ground. Uh, not the casualty, the rescuer. Yeah, the rescuer. Yeah. yeah. I think if, if you were a rescuer and you chose a um, canopy anchor rather than a basal anchor because you were worried about weight, we're, we're probably in a really, really dangerous area already. Like, I think mm. if, you know, a canopy anchor might be realistically 1.4, um, times the load. I, I don't believe that anyone can assess it that accurately. Yeah, because you wouldn't be able to load test it prior for, unless you, it makes it hard, doesn't it? It really does, yeah. Let me just see if I can find, oh, sorry, I've lost it a bit. Um, so that's, that's this is this other manual I'm flicking across to is a tray a training manual for vertical rescue teams to perform tree rescue. Um, so this is one of the their basic approaches. This is discussing how do we get a lift point in position above a casualty, this, this floating anchor approach. So I just flick across to this, as you're saying, Greg, in theory, if the two sides of the line are running parallel, um, a canopy anchor is stronger than a basal anchor because you've halved the load applied to the tree. But number one, if we're talking about redirecting anything to lower, we know that the two sides of the rope aren't running parallel. And we're almost, we're almost never going to be worried about an anchor being so high that the vertical compressive force applied to the tree structure is a problem. Like the problem is always going to be this lateral loading, snapping something out. And I think it's easier to set, set something like this up with a basal anchor so that you've got, you know, fairly obtuse angles and, and fairly good compressive force. Um, I think it's easier with a basal anchor than, than a canopy. So I, I would think that it's unlikely that the rescuer is forced into a canopy anchor. 
And I think if you were panicking, like if you imagine you're trying to get to someone who's injured, I think if you've reached the stage of thinking, I can't use a basal anchor here, I need to use a canopy anchor because it's 1.5 times less force. <laughs> I think you should, if I'm the casualty, I want you to leave me there, please. <laughs> and come back when you've had a cup of tea. And <laughs> um, let's see if I, sorry. I shouldn't stop sharing, sorry. So that's like the fancy version of that. Again, that's that's just this is aimed at vertical rescue teams. So it's got hence why it's got two separate ropes, because one of the other things they think we're insane for doing is not having a separate safety line all the time. Um, but again, that's set up, they would call this, that's their whole field. So if they encountered this, obviously. Anyone, any one of us would be pleased to find another tree growing out over our casualty. Um, but that's, that's a fairly standard rescue setup that they would default to fairly quickly. So even if they were gonna send someone up this line to do a personal rescue, they're gonna try and number one, they're gonna try and make anything they send up, they want to make it rescuable as well. And number two, they're going to plan, can they put their mechanical advantage somewhere else to try and make it team-based rather than all on the climber? We just don't have that luxury. Like, obviously we don't normally have three or four proficient people with a range of equipment turn up with us whenever there's an accident. Um, go back to my own. So that, yeah, I recommend this. I think if you're going to, I'll just do it quickly here. I'll get this other stuff out of the way. Can you guys see this lamp? This is my, um, this is my lamp <laughs> doing double duty as a tree. Mm -hmm. is that, can you see that all right? Yep. So, Pretty much our rescue kit, again, we've got um, a prusik, but just to try and make this, I want to try and make this as short as I can. This is a really long prusik, so I might try and shorten it up a bit for this. Um, but basically all I'm doing is pulling a bite through there and I'm going to do my lift. I'm going to do my lift with that bike. A carabiner would be good enough here. The, the friction of that pulley isn't a, 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 a super big deal. But if I can, I'll connect the casualty using a pulley. Sorry, putting a pulley on the bike. But all I've got to do now is is secure that somehow. Um, this is going to be a perfectly normal MRT system. So a four wrap English classic will be good. I might use an extra wrap though to lose a bit of that slack. I didn't want to come down with them. I could secure it up here somewhere. So I could even put an Alpine in above my Prusik. That gets the load completely off me. We've now got, we then have 50% of the load in the tail and 50% of the load on, a, on an English, which would be secured into an Alpine up here somewhere above, above my Prusik. That's not gonna be possible to do if you're hanging in the line. Like that's only gonna work. Obviously you can't tie a knot in the loaded line. Um, so 
So instead of that little um, girth hitch I had before, I've tied an eight now just to chew up some slack. And that's my lift. That'll, the, the lower, the pulley of my hitch climber will tend that English prusik. I know it looks like a dog's breakfast there. I'm sorry about that. Um, until I've lifted them as high as I can. When I let go, that'll, that'll sit back until um, whatever sit back distance of my prusik. So that's why I was trying to get that prusik nice and tight because it was a fairly long prusik to begin with. That means I'm not sort of lowering them as far down as I, I was. And I'm basically ready to go now. But to lift them up, get them to there. I could even keep my panting on the tail side. I could keep my panting on that and keep them lifted up whilst I disconnected their system. And basically, all I've got to do is adjust that prusik and off they go. So it's super, super minimal equipment, quick and easy to do. Most, most SRT kit will do this. Um, the stuff that doesn't have a lower prusik tending pulley doesn't let you stand on this side of it. So if you imagine an akim, didn't bring one up here. If you imagine an akimbo there instead of that um, hitch climber, because it doesn't have the prusik, you won't let you pull the tail through to do your three to one lift. You'll be back to doing a straight two to one lift and tending the slack yourself. Um, in that case, if that's what's going to happen, you're probably better off. So if you're teaching a group of students and some of them are using, so zigzag and a chicane, this works great with. Um, the new runner it works with. It might be better off. So if you imagine that that's an akimbo. I'll just put, it on this harness. So that's the rescuer's harness there, which you can only just see in the shot, I imagine. Using the same gear, we might be better off leaving the akimbo completely out of it. And I'll just um, clip that pulley I had the ring again and I'll pull the bite through the pulley just like I was doing with the other one and then basically apart from that everything's the same I'll now because I've used up my pulley on the um the fair lead here I've now got to use a carabiner on the bite to connect to the casualty again rig this prusik And I'd probably be happy enough rigging that off that central connection as well. So, what rope's that, Joe? Oh, it's not tree climbing rope at all. It's a short length of rock climbing rope that I found in the shed um, 10 minutes ago. All right. Yeah, it just looked different. I hadn't seen it before. Yeah, just didn't want to carry up loads of filthy tree climbing ropes and put them in my office. <laughs> so that that's using the same kit, same same outcome. Um, 
it would work then if you didn't have a lower, if your SRT device wasn't suitable to use the lower fair lead pulley as your lifting pulley for this. Yeah. Any questions about this method at all? Move on. I think we're coming up on time, so we should just talk about how, how do you go with, oh, sorry. That's the last one. So that's maybe your lanyard, if you're hanging in space. That's the last option for pickoff. That's a, again, that's a standard CE lanyard or tree, what do they call it, hip star now. Um, at plus that one extra pulley repurposed as a personal MA system. So I've taken the rescue prusik and slug it on the termination side, on the splice side of the climbing line. That means I'm lifting not off my harness at all, like I'm keeping them completely clear of me. Not um, it also means that I'm setting them slightly higher. So if I choose to lift them higher compared to me, it doesn't matter so much about this slack here. And then that's just set up as a two to one or a three to one if you could find a way, three to one counterbalance if you could find a way to stand on that. T teach that at all, Greg? No, no. Um, from, from, the, from the point of view of the unit, any one of those would be completely fine. So if you're finding that your groups are not finding the MRT pickoff useful or that your contact time with them is short enough as mine is on that topic that you can get everyone to succeed in doing it but you don't believe they could do it in three days later, um, I think it'd be much better off teach them something that they can use and, and that they have a chance of remembering. Definitely, mm. yeah. Good, good. Yeah. Yeah, the last time I went through all this with you, Joe, was in 2017 in yeah. Sydney. Yeah. So a, lot, a few things have changed since then. This, it's, they have, but it is also important just to say it again even with all these changes, the chances that a student will ever do any of this stuff is basically zero. Like when they've, their mate's been injured, it's been a year and a half since they did it with you. If, if you've succeeded in turning them into the kind of person who, who learns this stuff online and practices it, that, 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 you know how I was saying that teach them the roles and responsibilities is the most important thing. If they're practicing it themselves, maybe they can do this stuff, but if, if they've got the ticket and they haven't thought about it since. Doesn't matter what we teach them. It, in terms of the ropes and the knots, doesn't, doesn't matter at all. Because they won't do any of it. They, they can't possibly, it won't be safe to even. Like you say, Joe, it's much more important to know where you are, how to get there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. God, if they get, honestly, if they get that right, I got that job as a control room Got the job in the police control room as a temp. I was supposed to be answering the non-emergency calls and about three days into my non-emergency call job, they said, we're short of, there's like industrial acts and we're short of people to answer the emergency calls who's up for having a crack. And on the first day I had someone whose brother had been sucked into the PTO of an, some sort of tractor and, and horrifically killed. And he just, like he called up and he was just basically yelling and I couldn't get the address out of him. He spoke to another, he spoke to another person later and they actually had a recording of that conversation. The same person that I'd spoken to, um, just screaming that his brother's dead, well, his brother's dead, but like saying I'd called half an hour ago, no one's here. And you can just hear the operator yelling, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And it wouldn't have made any difference. Like the guy was dead, but, um, yeah, if, 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 as you say, Brent, like if they can communicate where they are, 
and what's happened. And if they can get the right resources on the way, that has a that has a huge impact on the likelihood of the casualties outcome being improved. Whereas all this rope stuff, mm. we can imagine it. And because we tend to be quite good at it, that's the part of it we understand because we're not good at dealing with like chopped up tree climbers and um, trauma. We're good at tying carabiners onto ropes and moving people around in trees. So we think that the rope stuff's quite important. Um, mm. And we teach everyone that and we like to share it. But yeah, as you say, it, a bit like performance CPR on someone that's gassed themselves in their car it's kind of pointless but it makes us feel good yeah yeah well I, I just don't know like I, I recognize that I haven't got a clue on how to teach any of the stuff that would really seriously help and probably you need to go away and be a pro professional rescuer to learn it so yeah I end up teaching carabiners and ropes but anyway um how are you coping with the lateral movement or branch end rescues? Good. They're hard work, especially when it's yeah. raining. But um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, they work. It, I, I think it's that that side of it's really important yeah. because often, you know, especially with pruning and all that, got to get out nice and wide and bra on branches, and you just never know. What yeah. could, it could just be an in insect attack, or someone could have got yeah. stung by something or a bee being anaphylactic or something like that. You just, you yeah. never know. But yeah, the, the lateral movement rescues are working out pretty good and they have to work hard for it. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they often get that one. Yeah. So, so this, is, this would be my first choice. This is obviously a drawing aimed at rescue bodies not at arborists so again we're back to this um hall fields on the ground arborists would probably be looking to set, set a redirect and then do either probably that srt pick off to send with the casualty or worst case scenario try and rig some sort of mrt system through there but again if you can go going to ground based for this is so good like if you can if you can set up a ground based system that you've got someone who can actually use it branch and rescue gets easy you just got to get out there and kick them off the branch basically um uh, this is, sorry if i could jump in i uh, don't mean to be rude joe i've got to make a move tonight mate i'm sorry i've been on the been yeah, up yeah. on that at since about 2 30 this morning i'm getting a yeah. uh, not getting over you i'm just getting a bit over being having the eyes open at the moment so uh, uh, well, we're, we're over time already no, 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 that, that, that's fine, mate. But uh, yeah, I'm just going to have to pull the plug on it at the moment or, or I'm about to go to sleep. Uh, sorry. Thank you, Scott. No, no worries. Thank all, you, Joe. All good, it's been, Scotty. Appreciate it's you. Been very, very interesting. Appreciate your time. Appreciate you kept jumping on on uh, short notice, Scotty. Thanks, mate. Thank you. No, th thanks for the invite. It's been very informative. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Yes, Scott. No worries. We'll talk again later. Catch you soon. Cheers, bye. We've actually, there's only, I think there's only two more slides after this. Um, so, so anyway, that's a redirect option. That is a variation of the MRT. I'd normally do that. I'd pull up the tail and use the tail of my own climbing line to do that. Um, oh, sorry. So if you needed to, you can get rid of the blue prusik here and just tie in directly to it. You lose a bit of the ability to adjust the distance between yourself and the casualty, but if you were short of gear, you could get away with one less prusik there. And the last one is just the, that's what rescuers, that's their preferred way of dealing with branch end rescue. So they, they're always gonna have the casualty on two lines um, and by just rescuer goes out, redirects one of them, doesn't redirect the other, they call it twin rope offset, and they can now pretty much steer the casualty wherever they want. So they could track the casualty, they can track the casualty up this way and down, 
or basically anywhere between these two, yeah. they can they can weave them through from the ground. So would that be like a suspected spinal injury scenario that, with the, the emergency services involved? Is that something they do? So, so um, absolutely. So if we jump back to, let's jump. This is a good one to finish on. This is a good thing to finish out a discussion on to, for me. Um, imagine, so I don't know if this graph makes a great deal of sense to you guys, but, but basically um, down here, this is, a, this is rescues getting, the situation getting worse. So down here we've got, you know, someone's just been stung by a bee and they can't remember whether they're anaphylactic or not and they're perfectly chatty and they've decided to come down. Like it starts to get a bit more panicky, like it's a serious cut with a handsaw to their opposite arm. And when they get to the ground, you'll probably take them to hospital. You know, this is up here, a, a significant chainsaw injury that they may not survive. So we're already in, by the time we get to here, we're already talking about like pretty serious stuff. It's, it's possible that there could be things that end up up here where it's not a critical injury. Like it could be that they have cut a line and fallen into the tree and they're basically unhurt. It's just, you've got to keep them calm until you've got them tied on again. It could be that it's a relatively minor injury and their gear is compromised. But what, what we know is that, you know, anything that you, you do that increases this complexity um, makes the subsequent rescue response more complicated. So complicated injury could be spinal or neck damage, um, could be head trauma, could, you know, anything significant, puncture wounds, that kind of stuff, um, climber crush injuries, entrapment, uh, a suspended load still in the tree, the lines compromised, like the lines gone across the climber, all of those kind of things. Um, we also know that our there's a tiny, tiny window in which the typical representative of the ARB industry, um, it's not possible for the casualty to self-rescue and a typical arborist could still do something useful. Like we know that that window is minuscule. Um, even someone who's just come through, like your, your best student or us ourselves as trainers of this unit, it, it, like I've, I reckon I've probably, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if I've practiced it a thousand times more than any other arborist in Australia. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. I, I, I put myself somewhere here because I don't really believe that the rope skills matter much. What would matter for me would be whether the thing that I haven't been able to practice, thank goodness, is how I deal with a friend of mine who's been badly injured in front of me. And I have no idea how I would deal with that. The, the rescue teams have this huge advantage because they don't actually care that much about you. Like I, I work with them quite a lot and they're pretty, pretty callous with the way they talk about these these incidents, like it would be typical for them to say, oh, we had a great job last night. Um, 11 stab wounds and fell into, fell into a sewer. So, like super technically interesting. And I'm thinking like, man, that's pretty full on. I, I, I'm not making that up by the way. Um, pretty full on like, you know, incident. That's someone's life that's been obviously ended in that case. Um, but they can't think about it like that. They, they think about taking care of themselves, doing the job properly, following their procedures. Whereas we go blazing in thinking that we've got to do something super fast and it all goes completely pear-shaped. So when you talk about like, what, you know, where would rescue professionals be involved? Greg, I, I would say our assumption should be that out of a hundred incidents, mostly the climber will self-rescue or it's out of our skill level. And there's probably only like three, maybe out of a hundred where it's within our skill level and it's the time matters. Um, there's probably about another 15 maybe tops. So less than one in five, way under one in five, in fact, that it's 
the right thing to do to climb the tree at all. So probably the best things that we could be doing is contacting emergency services, cleaning up on the ground. So get, get all the stuff away from the base of the tree, get the vehicles out the way, make sure they can get their tower in. Um, you, mostly if you guys are in urban areas and you're gonna get the fire brigade um, rather than CFA coming to you, uh, they'll probably bring something like a 36 to 50 meter um, articulating bucket suitable for craning. You can put two people in it, uh, like multiple person loads. They'll probably, if you, if you haven't blocked them in, if they can get that on site, they'll probably have it up with the climber within a couple of minutes after arriving. And again, average response time is 11 minutes. So I think, you know, thinking about these questions is a really good thing. And we are in a position where it, is, it does matter that we articulate these questions well, because we're going to have to answer them from students. And even if we never perform, or we don't often perform serious rescues ourselves, like I know I've, I've rescued lots of students, but normally I could have left them there and I probably should have done. Um, <laughs> It, you know, it's certainly the case that our students will be doing this or will be in a situation where they feel like they ought to, even if they probably shouldn't. Yeah, so I think that's, unless anyone's got any other questions, I think that's it from me. That's That, that slide's a good one to finish talking about. Yeah. Um, thanks for all of that, Joe. I just got one more thing. Yeah. I usually run through the, the stop aid air rescue transfer um, sure. with with the guys. Yep. And I still stand there and, and make sure they take five deep breaths yep. during the rescue situation because I find like, you know, you, you just don't know if some guys, some, some might suffer, they might be great workers on site. They might be um, really good climbers in a tree and, and have all the right skills but they could also suffer from anxiety. They could also have me mental problems, problems at home. Or and then yeah. as soon as something happens, everything just turns to mush. So it's really important. I think the five deep breaths. It sounds silly, I know, five deep breaths, but I use it a lot because even when they're climbing, and just practicing their climbing and getting their skills up sometimes I see they'll try and rush things through a bit. And I said, just slow things down a little bit, take five deep breaths. And then you, then you can think about yeah. what you want to do next because your, your mind's racing away way too fast. And sometimes I've had to learn to do that for myself because when I'm up a tree, up in a tree climbing, sometimes I feel my myself racing. I want to want to get this done. I want to do that, done, get that done. And now I don't, do that anymore I, I actually sit there for a minute and then I, I take those deep breaths and then I'm, I'm good like I can keep moving along and I think I feel like my climbing's improved because of it as well I couldn't I should have talked about that more thank you for talking about that it's it's it is a hard thing to do and it's odd to do it in front of the group, isn't it? Like whenever I demonstrate it, I feel weird standing there in silence. We're all looking at each other. It's actually, it's a form of meditation as well. So it's, it's quite handy. I, I, I'm the same. I, like I find it sometimes, I don't know what, it, I don't know why this happens, but sometimes I feel like I need to demonstrate to the students that I can climb trees well enough to be standing up the front. And I forget that the important thing to be demonstrating is how slowly I can go. And I temporarily feel like I need to show them that I can be very productive and fast to justify being up the front of the class. And if I forget to do those breaths and I start rushing, I, 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 some back in the day, I feel like I could still convince them that I could go quick. Now I'm not so sure they're not just being polite. Um, but yeah, it, it goes completely out of your head and you end up demonstrating entirely the wrong thing. So yeah, I'm the same. I find it really important to do, to just stop and think. And the, the rescue crews, 
are glacially slow compared to us. So really, really take their time and follow the procedures. Just totally, well, not completely off topic, but no, everybody's probably cursing. Shut up, shut up, we want to go. Um, I read a, an article, I can't remember where it was now. I think it was an R age uh, regarding, and it wasn't regarding suspension trauma. It was regarding um, basically a climber being hung or hanging in an upright, in a vertical upright position like the soldiers on parade where they're not doing their exercise and the blood flow through their legs, their heart's not strong enough to pump it back up to their brain and they pass out. Um, and an important thing if that does happen is to get, get somebody back horizontal as in the soldiers on parade, they fall down, the blood flows back to their head and they wake up again. Whereas if you're suspended in a harness in a vertical position, it's a different thing to get suspension from. Have you heard that, Joe? And, and is there a technical name for that? It is just another name for suspension trauma. They call it orthostatic sock or harness induced pathology are the two other names that it gets called. Um, yeah, okay. we don't have a we don't have a record of it occurring in with industrial harnesses. Okay. So there's um the, there's some good there's some good studies of it. Um, I've got all these books here, so I might. If anyone's interested, some of these books are available online. Like all of these are rescue books, and um, some of them, like that, you can download. It's just the Park National Park Service in the US um, cool. uh, Technical Rescue Handbook. Like it's mainly aimed at um, cliff and wilderness rescues. So a lot of it you can, you know, you don't need to learn much about rock climbing, anchors for tree climbing. But there's good, there's good stuff in there. They talk about this quite a bit. Um, so there is a lot of um, history of this orthostatic shock or harness induced pathology or suspension trauma. It's all, all the same thing. Um, having very serious effects on people from mountaineering. Like obviously rock climbing and mountaineering wear very thin harnesses that are not designed to suspend you for long lengths of time. And also the position that they suspend you is, is very different to ours. Like ours naturally like can't you back and put a portion, a, put a portion of your weight onto the back of your harness. So I could imagine that this would be a problem in ARB, but there hasn't been any case history of it at all, either in here or or the US, of suspension trauma being an issue. Yeah, well, I was always under the impression that suspension trauma was, and I'm probably probably not right, but it was a toxin build up, and then when you release that, that's what causes some issues. Is that correct? I think that's more when you've got a log line on your brain or something like that, isn't it? Isn't that a toxic shock? Well, that's what I thought it was similar to the yeah. suspension trauma. Yeah, Whereas the, the thing that I was sort of talking about was, uh, you know, like the just the no blood flow to your brain because your blood's in your legs <laughs> rather than anywhere else. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on this stuff. No, no, that's cool. I just a um, question. That's all. Fortunately, I have I have just been working with um, a, the lead paramedic of the uh, TASI fire service on common arborist injuries and response priorities. So I can answer what he said, even though if I don't really know what, what it all means. Um, where have we gone? So harness induced pathology, also known as suspension trauma or ortho orthostatic shock. Um, the Australian Resuscitation Council put out a notice on this in about 2014. So if you Google Australian Resuscitation Council orthostatic shock, there's this full um, A4 page description of how it occurs. Um, you, you, are, you are right that it is to do with blood flow. I don't believe it's to do with um, toxic shock. I, I think uh, that 
as someone, as Dave said, I think that is to do, or as Michael said, that is toxic shock is the release of crush. Orthostatic shock, suspension trauma affects people who are left there, not when you move them back into the, not when you release them. Um, and in fact, it used to be that even as late as 2012, we were taught to retain the casualty in the position with which you found them. If you, if you suspected they'd been that way a long time, we were taught to keep them hanging in their harness until you were able to hand them over to paramedics. So I did a simulated rescue in about 2010 with the police in which we brought the casualty to ground level and left them hanging in the harness for handover. In fact, we disconnected them and carried them in the harness to, to the ambulance. But since then, this um, resuscitation council notice said, uh, it's got nothing to do with toxic shock release. We do, do actually need to lie them down, loosen the harness um, and, and rest them. Yeah, that's interesting. That's good, actually, because it's totally the suspension trauma I always thought was from previous bits and pieces that I'd seen was to do with toxic shock, but it's not actually at all to do with toxic shock. Yeah. Cool. No, it was just a, an interesting article I read years ago, and I remember yep. Uh, yep. I remember that and just chugged my memory. So, okay, cool. It's it's not worth thinking about for us. Like it it. it it was a trend when I was doing the climbing comps, which is now about 12 years ago. It, it was a trend in the industry to, to talk about and it sort of gave us an excuse to try and do rescues really fast because, oh God, suspension trauma will happen if he's there for another 30 seconds. But it's time to admit it doesn't seem to be happening to our breasts. So it would be really unlikely that and uh, you would encounter an arborist who's been hanging in a harness long enough to potentially have this where you would be performing the rescue, not a rescuer. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Mm. All good. All good. Anyone got any more questions for Joe? Because you'll think of it when you wake up in the morning or put your head on the pillow. Now's the time. You're welcome to send me an email as well if if you if you want. Or if there's anything that, or if you want any of those pictures or anything like that. Yeah, I might get some references um, of a couple of those books you got there, Joe, but we can we can chat about that later. And yeah. if anyone wants to ask Joe um, a question. I'm pretty sure most of you guys would have Joe's email by now, but uh, if not, flick it off and CC us all into it. Might create a, a bit of a conversation, and um, who knows where it, where it might end up. Um, so thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks um, for the effort that you put in there, and thanks everyone. Uh, we had a couple of latecomers, um, Suji and, and Rochi and Rowan. Thanks, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Thanks, everything. And um, looking forward to, you know, just getting into the habit of doing this more regularly. We'll try and work it out so that the sun's still up um, <laughs> when, when, when we're doing it. But, um, again, th th thanks, everyone. And thanks, it, Joe. Cheers, Mike. It, it, from my point of view, if you guys have any feedback about what was useful or what was a complete waste of your time or, like, what, the whole style of the presentation, anything like that. If you wanted to email it to Mike, you could anonymize it and send it on to me. Or if you, if you feel like it, just send it straight to me and I've got a thick skin. So I'll just forward it on. You forward it on. Yeah, that's it. Plenty to take away for, for consideration. And, and No, it's some very, I don't know you guys, but some very basic, valid points there. It was, um, it was very good. Well, thank, thank you all. Enjoy your evenings, what's left of them, and I'll chat to you again soon, I hope. Thanks, guys. Appreciate guys. it, Joe. Thank you. Thank you Joe. Thanks, Please. guys. All right.